So we'll have time for additional uh, questions when we get into the discussion period. Um, I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Neha Garg to come up next. She'll speak about spatial mapping of the microbial and molecular universe. Dr. Garg. Thank you, organizers, for the wonderful workshop. Uh, I'm really excited to tell you today about how we can begin to explore the biological context of our variation in microbiome and metabolome through spatial mapping. Let me begin by saying we live in a universe of small molecules. We interact with our environment through these molecules, which are extremely large in number and diverse in structures. If you consider my hand, the molecules on my hand are coming from the molecules that my body is making, that the microbes on my body are making, from the drugs and personal care products I use, and from the interactions that I have with you and my environment. If you extend my hand to my entire body, you can appreciate that the inventory of these molecules is extremely large now, and that this inventory is very complex. So how do we begin to explore this very large diversity and complexity of molecules? In the Doristein lab at UC San Diego, we develop tools to respond to these challenges. And today I will show you some of the systems that we are working on. All right. So one of the techniques that we use is mass spectrometry. In a mass, spec in a mass spectrometry, each molecule generates one spectra. If you believe that I have millions of molecules on me, I have generated millions of spectra. How do you begin to mine such a big data and derive biological context from this data? So we use a trick in mass spectrometry to respond to this challenge. The trick is that when you energize a molecule in a mass spectrometer, it falls apart to generate fragments. Similar molecules, that is molecules that are similar in structure, generate similar fragments. So we can organize our spectra based upon these similar fragments so that we end up with these molecular networks where each spectra or each molecule is represented by a node. And the connecting nodes represent molecules that are similar in structures. So using this uh, strategy, we can organize our entire data sets into a map of molecular families. Shown here, for example, are two molecular families. But in reality, a data set has many such molecular families, such as lipids, peptides, amino acids, antibiotics, and whatnot. The challenge that still remains is, how do we begin to explore the origin or source of these molecules? And how do we identify what these molecules are? Let me explain this by taking the example of human skin. As I just mentioned, the molecules on human skin are coming from, for example, beauty products that we use. So we can uh, acquire mass spec data on these beauty products and feed it to our network to visualize the molecules that are coming from beauty products. Similarly, microbial molecules can be visualized by culturing these uh, microbes in the lab and feeding the data to our network. Human molecules can then be visualized by culturing, for example, the skin cells in the lab and feeding that data to the network to visualize where these molecules are. So using this strategy, we can begin to explore at least sources of some of these molecules. In order to identify what these molecules are, we match our entire data sets against the MSMS libraries. The platform to do this kind of analysis is now available online, and it was developed at UC uh, San Diego in collaboration uh, with Bandera Lab. So one can create networks, uh, analyze networks, uh, contribute to mass spectral libraries on this platform. So now we have uh, uh, found ways to find the origin of these molecules and identify what these molecules are. This brings us, brings us to our next challenge. How do we associate this information with the habitat under study and the associated microbiome? To respond to this particular challenge, we use spatial mapping. We map the metabolome and the microbiome back on the habitat using the physical coordinates uh, of the sampling sites, and then map the abundance of the chemicals and the microbes on these, uh, uh, on these sampling sites. And I will come back to this information in, uh, in a little bit. So now we have appreciated the challenges associated with big data, and we have looked at some of the tools that we can use. Let me now show you the applica ap <coughs> applicability of these tools through some examples. And let us begin with the human skin study. So in order to map the uh, microbiome and metabolome of human skin, we, uh, we sampled 400 sites on the body of a man and a woman through 16 sRNA sequencing and mass spectrometry. We then map this information back onto the 3D model of a man and a woman. So each spot here represents uh, one sampling site, 
and the color represents the abundance of the microbe or the molecule. So one map here is a map of either the abundance of that microbe or that molecule on the body of that person. So using this strategy, we found that there were distinct and heterogeneous chemical environments on the body of a man and a woman. For example, specific molecules were found in the armpit, groin, or the toenails of the women, and specific molecules were found on the ear, belly button, head, and hand of the man. Similar to mapping of chemical environment, mapping of 16S rRNA revealed distinct and heterogeneous microbial environments. Shown here are three examples. So we found that Staphylococcus was mainly present in the moist areas around the nose and the foot of the uh, man and women. Propionibacterium was mainly present on the face, chest, and back area of the man and the women. And Cornibacterium was mainly present on the head, uh, feet, and toe of these volunteers. So using spatial mapping, we can identify specific regions of a habitat that are unique in microbes or molecules. Can we compare these two to see how the microbes or the molecules affect each other? In order to do this, we use Pearson correlation, and we compare the distribution of each molecule with each microbe or each microbe with each molecule. Let me show you one example of this analysis. So I just mentioned that propionibacterium was mainly localized at the face, chest, and back of the man and women. When we compared this distribution with the distribution of every molecule that was detected in our mass spec experiment, we found that this distribution strongly correlated to the distribution of free fatty acids. Now, the hypothesis is that maybe propionibacterium can hydrolyze lipids on our skin, leading to the production of these free fatty acids. This hypothesis was indeed true when we tested in vitro hydrolysis of lipids by propionibacterium and found that oleic acid and oxidized oleic acid were indeed the major hydrolysis products in vitro. So spatial mapping uh, of this microbiome and metabolome in this example tells us that the microbes on our skin can change the chemical environment of our skin. We have now expanded this study from two volunteers to four volunteers. And when we looked at the overall chemical environment of these four volunteers through principal component analysis, we found that each of this volunteer had a very unique chemical environment in that they cluster into four different clusters representing each individual. And at least 8% of this chemical makeup was coming from the beauty products that these people were using. So we wanted to analyze uh, uh, skin samples from people who, who are not exposed to these beauty or personal hygiene products. So we looked at the samples from a tribe in Tanzania, Hazda people, who are not uh, exposed to these uh, chemicals or beauty products. And what we found through molecular networking uh, in their metabolome is that the molecules that we could find on their skin represented the kind of food they were eating, for example, beehive, and some of the lifestyle uh, uh, habits, such as the plants they were smoking. So through these examples today, I've shown you that our metabolome is affected by uh, our microbiome, our lifestyle, uh, the beauty products we use, the food we eat, and the kind of uh, habits we have. With these examples, let me continue and tell you another story, a microbiome-associated story that is relevant in human health. This story is about infections in cystic fibrosis. Those of you who are not familiar with cystic fibrosis, CF is a genetic di disease that eventually leads to buildup of thick mucus in the upper airways and the lungs of children and adults with cystic fibrosis. So mucus is a perfect environment for the microbes to stick and grow and form biofilms. Now these people undergo recurrent microbial infections throughout their, life, uh, throughout their lifespan and have a very poor quality of life, leading to an average life of 35 to 40 years of age. What we wanted to investigate was how the microbial biofilms that we study in petri plate cultures, for example, are affected by the chemical environment of the lung, and what kind of pharmaceutical and uh, environmental exposures do these micro microbial biofilms have in the lungs? In order to ask these questions, we needed human lungs infected with, for example, uh, uh, pathogens of cystic fibrosis. As I just mentioned, pa patients with CF have uh, multiple uh, infections throughout their lifespan. So their lungs are damaged, and they're often listed for organ transplant. When they undergo organ transplant, we take the lungs that are taken out from their body, we slice them into thin slices, and further section each slice into small cubes. We acquire 16S rRNA sequencing and mass spectrometry data on each of these cubes. 
Now the next step is to map this data back onto the human lung so we can compare the microbiome and the metabolome in these uh, uh, isolated regions of the lungs. In order to do that, we create 3D models of the human lungs from CT scans that are taken prior to surgery. Now in order to map the data, we have now upgraded our visualization tool such that we can not only map on the surface but in volume so that we can uh, change the transparency of our models. We can go zoom in, go inside the lungs and see where the molecules and microbes are present inside the lungs. So using this strategy, we found through our 16S rRNA sequencing, three of the four patients that we studied had pseudomonas infections. So we cultured the pseudomonas in the lab and we compared the metabolome of pseudomonas in the lab cultures <coughs> with the data that was acquired on the lung tissue itself. Shown here is a molecular network of a family of quinolones that are produced by Pseudomonas aeruginosa and are involved in the biofilm formation by Pseudomonas. What we see is a lot more quinolones shown in these gray nodes are produced in petri plate cultures, whereas only a handful of quinolones shown in color were present in the lung tissue. Furthermore, different patients had different quinolones shown by difference in color. Most importantly, PQS, Pseudomonas quinolone signal, the most well-studied quinolone from uh, uh, infections by Pseudomonas was not detected in the lung. So this clearly shows there's a disconnect between, what, between the biofilm formation in in vitro in lab studies to what we see in the chemical environment of the lung. So what might be causing this in the lung? Lung, in, when we study these microbial biofilms in petri plates, for example, we do single cultures, but the lungs have multiple organisms uh, uh, growing inside uh, that represents polymicrobial infections. So we looked at the distribution of the microbes and the molecules. When we looked at the distribution of pseudomonas, we saw that pseudomonas was present throughout the lung at a very high abundance, except the region around the big airway. And this was precisely the location where quinolone production was detected, and quinolones weren't present in any other part of the lung. So when we compared the abundance of 16S rRNA data, we found that these are also precisely the locations where we see microbial interactions in that other organisms such as granuli catella and staphylococcus was present in these locations where, by, uh, where um, NHQ, the quinolone, was detected. So this highlights that the polymicrobial interactions in the lung lead to metabolic divergence, biofilm formation, and likely hotspots of inflammation in these regions of the lungs. So in addition, now let's look at what other factors, uh, in addition to polymicrobial uh, interactions, can cause heterogeneity in the lungs. The first factor that comes to mind for CF patients is the antibiotics. These patients are taking gram quantities of antibiotics for weeks when they have these infections. Using molecular networking, we can not only identify the parent drug, for example, piperacillin in this case, but also the known metabolites and the unknown degradation products that are present in the lungs of these patients. Uh, spatial mapping helps us to visualize the distribution or the heterogeneity in penetration of these drugs and their metabolism, and reflects the regions where these microorganisms are exposed to differential uh, selection pressure from antibiotics. Very interestingly, for patient one, we saw that the antibiotic meropenem didn't penetrate to the base of the lung, and this was the region where we found this microorganism, Acromobacter. So Acromobacter is likely hiding where the antibiotic is not penetrating, and you can articulate that given enough time, this microorganism may develop antibiotic resistance and spread through the lungs. And this is certainly seen for CF patients that they over time develop uh, infections that are antibiotic resistant. Among environmental exposures, very interestingly, we found phthalates in the lungs. Now, we know that phthalates are very toxic to gut epithelial cells. They can lead to apoptosis. They also cause uh, complications in H. pylori infections. But we do not know what phthalates do to, the, do to the lung epithelial cells and how do microbiome respond to such environmental exposure. So with these examples, I've shown you today that our microbiome and metabolome is affected by our habits, by our food, by our environmental and uh, antibiotic exposure. I've shown you this today with very two different habitats. One is skin and one is human lung that are infected with uh, pathogens. So let's compare these two environments. So when we compare these, the chemical makeup of these environments, we found that 4% of the molecules in lungs were common to skin. 
So this still leaves us with a lot of chemical space that we don't know what it is. So we compared other data sets that were available to us on our online uh, infrastructure GNPS, and we found that at least 10% of the molecules were common to data sets that were required on sinuses and sputums. At least 7% were common to bacteria, 3% to fungal data sets. This still leaves us with a lot of chemical space that represents dark matter. So how do we begin to uncover this chemical dark matter? In order to address this specific challenge, we've created a concept of living data. So on our infrastructure, there are multiple data sets from various habitats from scientists all across the world. And these data sets are matched to our libraries on a regular basis. So if a scientist uploads a new annotated data sets with the associated mass spectral libraries, all the other data sets are searched against this data, against this new uh, mass spectral library. And the uh, subscribers of these unannotated data sets are sent an email informing them of the new identifications that are now found in their data set. We hope that this allows scientific dialogue and collaboration between scientists all across the world, helping us to uncover this chemical space. This was really highlighted in the human skin study, where when we started, we only had 100 identifications. And over time, as our libraries grew, we now have 400 different, uh, uh, 439 identifications. So uh, during this time, one of the researchers on the GNPS community was working on heme degradation, and he uploaded spectra of the molecules that are found in heme degradation. We were notified by email that one of this molecule is found on our skins, uh, in our skin data set. So when we looked at the distribution of this molecule, we found that this molecule was mainly localized in the groin area of the women, and that there were certain microbial communities that were also localized in that area. So this helps us to build hypothesis that maybe these microorganisms are involved in the physiological process of heme degradation by the microorganisms. So with these tools and these examples, today I have shown you the challenges associated with big data set. I have shown you today that finding a biological context of an environment with millions of microbes and molecules represents like finding a needle in a haystack. And we hope that spatial mapping serves like a metal detector and helps us to find that needle in that big data set. This requires that mass spectral libraries become available. And, and today I've shown you with GNPS and living data, these mass spectral libraries are growing and helps us to annotate our data sets. Further, I've shown you today that our metabolomes are affected by our environment, by the drugs that we take, by the personal care products, our diet, and our food habits. With the micro, uh, microbiome initiatives, we have begun to explore the microbial dark matter, but the exploration of chemical dark matter is still in its inf infancy. We hope to change this in the future. With, uh, with that, I would like to thank my mentor, Peter Dorestein, and our collaborators, Night Lab, uh, with whom we do 16 srRNA sequencing, our hospital support, Rohr Lab, Bandera Lab, with which we created GNPS, Alexandrov Lab, that helped us to create our uh, visualization tool, ELI. With that, I would like to take any questions that you may have. Thank you for your attention. And while I take questions, I would leave you with this slide to ponder over what kind of molecules you are exposed in while sitting in an office or during this conference. <laughs> Is any part of the uh, GPS global database on chemicals uh, include uh, antibiotics? Yeah, so we bought um, NIH Clinical Collection 1, NIH Clinical Collection 2 FDA libraries. We acquired uh, mass spectral data on them. We, we annotated all the molecules. We've uploaded to it to our libraries and also as a public data set. So yeah. it, all of that information can be downloaded from GMPS. It was about 25 years ago, a Danish group showed that ampicillin is excreted in the skin of people who are on ampicillin and can select for um, MRSA. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we do find ciprofloxacin on the skin, for example. Hello from the University of Georgia. Great talk. So I got a question about the uh, metabolite identification. So during your mapping the uh, metabolites, so are you using the target or untarget approach? So if the untarget, what's the percentage of identification among all the molecular features you detect? 
So uh, it is untargeted. The uh, annotations are based on MS1, so the PPM error, and MS2. So the, the molecular networking ba is based on the concept that you match the MS2. So all the fra if, uh, if the fragments match completely, then it's an identical spectra. So you s that's how you identify known molecules. And then the molecules that are connected to these known molecules represents molecules that are structurally similar to this molecule. For example, uh, piperacillin and its uh, metabolite desethylpiperacillin are structurally very similar. Mm -hmm. So their fragments in MS2 are very similar. So when you compare them, uh, uh, the similarity score is very high. So they, they are connected to each other. So annotation is both MS1 and MS2 level. Okay, so among the other feature, what's the uh, roughly the percentage of identified uh, feature? Oh, le at our best, less than five percent. Still less than five. That's why I say that there's still this. This is still a chemical dark matter which okay. we need to explore. Okay, thank you. Yes, thank you for a nice talk. Uh, I'm Gloria Dominguez uh, Bello. Um, I wanted I wanted to comment. Uh, these methods are so powerful. You can get so much information about people's life, people habits, people's, and you don't need to go to the skin. I mean, you, you may swap the build environment and exactly know um, very sensitive information. And I just wanted to make the reflection that, uh, I mean, we are leading towards a um, world by which just taking a swab, we can know a lot of things. And I, just as, as an example, we may find illegal drugs that are in, you know, which is so sensitive, and especially if we do worldwide research in countries where that drug may be illegal, or you may find explosives, or, I mean, what do we do with that information? It's just a reflection to make, it's really powerful uh, technology. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really a great point. Ethics are always a big part of the study, and our institute review board allows us to uh, talk about certain molecules and not about other molecules. So I think that's where the institute review board is playing a greater role. So we're going to take a, a very brief break till 3 o'clock, and then we're going to come right back. Um, okay, and Marilee will tell you about coffee if you run quickly.